So Doreen, in, in speaking with patients, um, do they consider their illness a chronic one that they're gonna have for a while? Yes, I think in, inherent in the name is, uh, is that this is gonna be a lifetime uh, condition. Um, long remissions are uh, hoped for, and um, that's, that's what we're all striving for, but it is something that you have to adjust to in your life to have uh, make accommodations for that in your life for treatment and for checkups and radical, re regular medical intervention, yeah. And Nathan, how did that information as a chronic illness affect your lifestyle? The chronic portion came probably about a month after I was diagnosed. Um, the, f the first month was hard dealing with that and as I got more knowledge and understood the chronic nature of it, it became easier to tolerate. Um, it, and with the knowledge and these new treatments that have come out, it's, it, I, I went from a short, dealing, feeling that it was gonna be a short-term issue to you know, what, whatever my options were treatment-wise. And, and with the new treatments, um, things are getting pushed out farther and farther. I had a little bit of a more, because of my age of diagnosis at 45, I, I tend to be on the lower end of the diagnosis range. I have a longer time to deal with it. So knowing that there's more treatments out there and it has switched, I believe, to a chronic illness, I, I'm more at peace with it. You know, it, it's a very common reaction, by the way. And I, just yesterday, sitting with one of my own patients with a different chronic leukemia, um, six months into her chronic therapy for that, she said, you know, when I was diagnosed, I was in the go, go, go mode. I'm gonna tackle this, I'm gonna learn about it. And now it's six months later, and that might affect how you feel, you know, over time. Has that affected you, your relationship with Lisa, family? It has. I, I look at my initial diagnosis as kind of the two stages. The, the first was the uh, devastating news. I was 45, I had two kids in elementary school. Um, and, and at that time, as you start researching, um, I, I came in right as these new novel therapies were starting to more come online um, outside of trial. Uh, and that was back when you would, you would type in CLL on the internet and you know, you're, you know, you're dead in seven years, you know, misinformation that was out there. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the very first three weeks were really rough on me. Um, as I got the knowledge and the, the current data, that's, that's as things progressed, but it was definitely a trying time initially. Um, and, and like I said, with the knowledge and getting the provider that I needed, um, that helped. Lisa? Um, I definitely didn't, I didn't understand the chronic portion of it in the beginning. It, um, the first provider that Nathan saw, uh, she very much made it seem like we're gonna do chemotherapy and then you're good to go. Um, so as we, as he was seeing um, his second, and then of course uh, we had a second provider, and then we went for a third um, opinion with Dr. Flynn. Um, the reality of it sunk in for me, um, and I and I certainly was grateful that Dr. Flynn could explain that this is becoming more of a, a disease that you just have to manage for the rest of your life, um, because of course you know I, I feel like we're young in the sense that he was you know, 45, I was 35, our children are young. Um, so initially it was very difficult for me to imagine you know, if the worst happened. And um, you know, we had also just moved to a new state. I started a new job. So um, it was a very challenging time for us in general. Um, but I think as time went on and we understood that uh, this is unlikely to, for him to die anytime soon, um, and I think too, when you're constantly dealing with something every day, it just becomes your new normal. Um, so it's not like you feel this shock or overwhelming grief forever, initially you do. Um, so it, and, and I think too, we have children that are young, so it forced us to um, not focus too heavily on it. Um, the kids were still, you know, still needed us, still had their own problems and things that we had to deal with, uh, and that was helpful. Um, but yes, I mean, initially, it was just a very shocking um, thing to deal with, and um, it was rough. We're going to come back to talking about uh, those uh, children. Ian, I want to come back to you, though. Um, sounds like Nathan went into therapy quite 
quickly, and we'll talk about why that might be, but does everyone need therapy immediately? No, thankfully not. I mean, many patients are diagnosed these days through, you know, a health maintenance examination. They get a, a CBC drawn. Their, 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 uh, their physician realizes they have a mildly elevated white blood cell count. And so they're completely asymptomatic. We know and, and, and really have no need for therapy at that time. We know through decades of clinical trials that we do not need to start therapy at the time of diagnosis. This is you know, one of the hardest concepts to, to get across to, uh, to patients to begin with. You say, you just diagnosed me with cancer and you wanna do nothing, you must be crazy, right? I mean, everything everyone's ever learned about treatment of cancer is that the early therapy is the key to long-term success. Diagnosis early and, and then. But this is one of the exceptions, right? I mean, we know that, that um, our therapies today are excellent. I mean, they're really good. They're so much better than they were a decade ago. But it doesn't, but people aren't necessarily better off getting them um, being treated early in the course of disease than waiting till they start to develop signs or symptoms of, of it. Um, I tell people, patients, that you know, if you come in to me and the first thing I ask you is, you know, is, can you tell that there's anything wrong? And they say, no, I, I can't. Then there's no medicine that I can, can give you that's going to make you feel better than that. Right. And, and so we're oftentimes better off waiting until um, there are other clinical manifestations. They start to develop problems from the disease and then start therapy at that time. So Ian used some of those words, watch and wait. Camille, what do patients tell you about this watch and wait approach? So what's interesting is that, I mean, we've had some patients come to see us um, that actually want to watch and wait, that where they've been to other providers and they, they know enough about the disease or they want to push treatment off. Um, but yeah, I just try to tell patients that, you know, as long as they're, like Dr. Flynn said, as long as they're feeling good um, and there's no obvious reasons to start treatment, then it's not going to harm them in the long term. Because I think that's a, that's a question they have, right? Is, you know, what kind of damage is this going to do to me if, if we don't do anything right now? And so you just have to reassure them that there's not going to be any long term, you know, issues with survival or um, organ damage um, if we don't do anything. But Doreen, some patients say it's not watch and wait, it's watch and worry. So, yeah, that, so how do we deal with that? That's true. Well, I think the most important thing is to educate yourself. And with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we usually have time before we need treatment. <clears throat> so it's so important to educate yourself and make sure that you're getting accurate information. The CLL Society was formed by a group of patients led by a doctor who uh, had, was a CLL patient himself and knew the importance of trying to get accurate information out there because there is so much on the internet that will increase that worry. And so if you educate yourself before you need treatment, um, I, I kind of call it front loading your education before you need it, learn the options out there, learn your markers and what the best options are for your CLL, and then you can sit back and wait and know what to look for. Uh, of course, your care provider will be watching you closely. And then when it's time to start treating, then you, you kind of have whatever treatment is suggested, you kind of have an idea of what are the side effects of that treatment, what are the benefits of combination treatments. So I think education is the most important thing in that watch and wait uh, period. Okay. But I also think it's important to be careful of where you're going for your education because there's so, like you were saying, there's mm -hmm. so much information, but not any sort of wisdom behind it or context. Yeah. Yeah. So people can get really afraid. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the CLLsociety.org mm -hmm. is the organization. There are uh, all sorts of resources, videos, and um, glossary of terms, treatments, um, uh, doctors that specialize in CLL. There's so much information there, and that group has culled out the information to sort of make it current and accurate. 